Okay, so um, let's get started, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Mary Eleanor Power, and I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications with Dalhousie University's College of Continuing Education. I'd like to begin today uh, by acknowledging that Dalhousie University is located in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. We are all treaty people. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Diversity, Inclusion and the Missing Piece, hosted by Rebecca Skeet. Rebecca has worked in the employment field for more than 25 years and is a director with the YMCA Nova Scotia Works Employment Services Centers. She's a DAL grad and holds a master's degree in social work and is a private practice social worker providing counseling to children and families. Rebecca has been involved with the Nova Scotia Career Development Association as the lead competency assessor for five years and was one of the first certified career development practitioners in Nova Scotia. Rebecca has developed and delivered workshops and training since she was trained as diversity in diversity at, by the Human Rights Commission in 2000. Some of the training includes diverse hiring practice, cross-cultural communication, diversity and inclusion training, and culturally relevant programming. Rebecca also teaches workplace diversity and inclusion at Dalhousie University's College of Continuing Education, along with a few other courses. And, uh, and now I'd like to introduce Rebecca to get us started. Thanks very much. No problem. I'm just looking and I see where it says January 2020. That's actually January 2021. That's, that's okay. Um, so welcome to our Lunch and Learn. Um, I'm going to be your facilitator for the next uh, half hour or so. During our time together, we're going to do a short activity. Um, we're going to have a discussion around some of the buzzwords um, and also followed by a discussion around some of the missing pieces when we talk about diversity and inclusion. So to jump right in, what I'm going to ask you to do is grab a piece of paper and a pen and write down five things that you must have in your workplace in order to feel safe. So we'll just do, we'll just take a couple of seconds for that. I have a timer literally <laughs> for 30 seconds. All right, do most people get that done? I can't see if people can give it like a thumbs up. Can you see that? See if they give it a thumbs up that they're, they're done that piece. Or you can add in the chat that you're all done. Oh, great. We have some hands here. Okay, great. And lots of people adding. Yeah, that's great. Okay. So then the next piece that we're gonna do is I want you to write down things that would kind of be like a, a deal breaker. What kind of things would make you feel unsafe at work? And that's another five things. Okay, we have that done. Okay. So I'm guessing that uh, some of the things that probably came up on your list would be examples of workplace values, right? Um, you probably see some things on this particular list that might be on your list that you wrote down in terms of some of the five things that you want. Um, and maybe some of the deal breakers, if you didn't have some of these things at work, some of these, these things that are on, um, on this list might also fall in line with that, right? Um, you know, and you, sometimes when we have different, when we work in certain places, we want to make sure, you know, we're attracted to places that um, have similar values, right? So if we, there's certain things that we value, sometimes we're attracted to employers that value those same, those same pieces. So imagine going to work every day in an environment and maybe, you know, you feel really proud to work for this employer, the values that they have um, are, are aligned with your values, but you don't necessarily feel 
safe at work, you don't necessarily feel included at work, um, and you feel like you may be treated differently based on you know who you are or your abilities. Um, when you think about some of the this 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 cloud of words here, there's a number of different buzzwords that we would have heard over the years, right? Um, so we probably heard things like we always hear about equity and rights, freedom. Um, we would have heard about you know targeted hiring. Um, there's you know celebrating diversity. We, there's lots of these different words that are, are, are quite trendy. Um, and I find now what we hear a lot is you know the celebrating diversity, which also could look quite different. Um, also, in terms of like representation, sometimes we want to, when, we, um, when we're hiring, we try to hire for diversity, but sometimes when we're hiring, um, you know, having diverse, diverse, diverse um, employees doesn't necessarily mean that we're creating an inclusive environment. So, um, when you think about celebrating diversities, there's a number of different activities that people tend to do. Um, you know, they might do things like potlucks. They might um, they might celebrate some of these some of these uh, recognized occasions. So, for example, we have you know Black History Month, Women's History Month, National Development Disability Awareness, tons of different occasions. And there's the list is much longer than this. This is just a couple of examples um, of some recognized occasions or months um, that we would see here in Canada. Um, sometimes you might see posters, right? So there's, if it's a certain month, some of them, there might be posters that are put up. Um, there might be webinars or certain learning opportunities. Um, again, potlucks um, with different types of food um, that help recognize some of these occasions. But what about the other 365 days, right? What about all the other days? So if we celebrate uh, you know, an occasion or we celebrate something that's cultural um, you know, once a year, you know, what about those other days when we're, when we're not doing that, right? What can we do, um, I guess, to actually create an inclusive environment as opposed to, um, you know, 365 days a week, as opposed to just having specific events, you know, or doing different hiring. So when you think about diversity, you know, this is a great picture of diversity with all the different puzzle pieces, right? They're, they're you know, they're different, they're different colors and they're, you know, maybe that's representative of a work team. But how do we get to that piece to actually create inclusion? What do we actually have to do in order to have that? Which is the missing piece? I'm not done. We're, what we're going to do is we will have some conversation. I've just put this up here in terms of um, some of the courses that uh, will be coming up. But what I'm going to do is I want to see the panel. Maybe I'll stop sharing for a minute. What are some of the things that we can do? I don't know if people want to either raise their hand. The only option to talk right now is through, through chat or are people able to unmute themselves if they want to speak? I believe uh, if you can, you're able, I believe everyone is able to mostly just, um, we have 93 people joining us. So oh, probably yeah. it would be easiest just to include in the chat. Yeah. Quite a okay, large so, group. Yeah. So what do you think some of the things that we could do in order to create an inclusive environment. So an inclusive environment, like, and, and that, that, that means like when people go to work, they feel welcomed. They feel like they're part of the team. They feel like their, their, their opinions are, are valued and they feel like they're valued as a person, like a full, a whole person. Um, sometimes you'll see workplace, there might be workplaces and it's very common for us to have silos, right? In many cases, people are often attracted to people who look like them, or maybe they went to the same school or that they have commonalities. There's a lot of times where um, people who, who may be different, they, they're isolated at work, right? And we may, not re we may not see that, and that may not be the intention. That may not be, the, it may not be purposeful, but that's just what happens, right? So in terms of actually creating an inclusive environment, we have to have, we have to be more mindful of what we do all the time to actually include people, right? Respect lived experiences and learn people's names. That was a, a suggestion that came out from Lindsay. Thank you, Lindsay. Team building exercises and games, that's another great idea. Some sort of workplaces, social contracts, where you engineer interactions and avoid silos and isolation, it's great. Because it happens all the time. It happens. It happens. It happens all the time. And like I said, sometimes it's not. It's not intentional. Um, I'll just give you an example. I remember one time I was at work and I noticed, you know, some of the staff they were, 
you know, going to lunch together, or you know, they would, you know, they would have their breaks together, and then every I'd see this one person, they would they would go to work or go to, go to lunch on their own. They would they would take their breaks on their own. They were always leave, coming and going. They were on their own. And I remember talking to the manager, and I said, "Oh my goodness, that person's almost like they're a little bit isolated. Like they're not really, they haven't really welcomed that person into the team. Like they might have said welcome, and you know, they might say hi and talk and about work, but they're not really a part of the team. Like they're not really included." And I said, I'm going to do a little experiment. Um, I'm just going to pay some extra attention to that individual, but like make it a point when I stop and just instead of just coming in and say, oh, good morning, good and keep going, you know, how's it going? How's the family? Just start, you know, really trying to include this individual. Um, you know, we were doing something, some kind of a holiday event, like a little competition. And I said, oh, are you going to participate? And they're like, well, no, I don't know if I have this. I was like, oh, you should do it. So just some extra encouragement. And it was kind of funny because then what we heard around the office is that um, they said that I had a a new favorite, right? Because people seen me paying attention to this individual like more, right? So it, it was funny because they almost took it like, I have a favorite staff as opposed to me, you know, paying attention to someone. So then one day we were all in the lunchroom and I told them about the little project that I did. And I said, you know, I, you guys are saying this and which, this is what I did. And they were kind of shocked but when they thought about it, they actually kind of got it. And I said, you know, I did this because I purposely paid attention and I purposely did this because this is what I observed, right? I said, I even told the manager, I'm gonna do this just to see what the result is. I said, and it's funny because you guys took, you know, me trying to include that person as that being a favorite, as opposed to thinking that's something that we could all do. And then it did end up changing the work environment for that particular team. But a lot of times we don't even, we don't realize that that's happening, right? Um, so we have to be aware. We have to be aware of what's happening around us. We have to be aware of, you know, we know there's certain things that we need at our work to, to feel safe. And we want other people to have that as well. I know there's some other comments here in the chat. Yeah, some po points around social contracts um, and setting up this idea of setting up practices and rules at meetings to ensure that everyone is respectful, um, has the opportunity to speak and be heard. Um, and the idea of ask, asking probing, probing questions and seeking to understand points of view, I think coming at it from a point of curiosity um, yeah. is, is kind of what's coming through as, as themes. Yeah, and even, yeah, posters, visuals to create a welcome space and even having that reflected in the team. Okay, scroll down here. Oop, what did I do? I did, I did something I had, I, okay, here we go. So what are some things that you have found that have worked well, Rebecca, in your experience? Um, and what have really been the missing pieces that, like, can we, can we point to specific um, activities, specific ways or activities or, or just w ways of, of acting and thinking and doing? Because in, in a lot of ways, I think it's, for some people, I'm sure that it's it's a matter of putting those things into practice, and then that yeah. becomes a change in their kind of overall way of of seeing people. Yeah. Right. So yeah. So I mean, one of the things that I do, and this is it's actually a neat little activity, so people might even want to take this and do that in their particular workplaces. But um, it's kind of like a team building activity, and what they have to do is you got a group of individuals. They have to um, they're paired up with someone in the environment that they don't know well, right? Um, and it might be hard if your team's kind of small, but it might be someone that maybe they don't normally go to lunch with or that they don't maybe work in that actual piece. And they have to actually um, have a conversation with each other to find commonalities, right? So, um, and it can't be obvious, right? It can't be obvious. So if you and I were doing it, so maybe, but maybe we can do that just to kind of give an example, right? So um, we're, gonna, I mean, we couldn't say, okay, we're both, you know, women, because that's obvious, right? So, um, do you have kids? Yes. I have okay. I, I have one. kids. One. I have two. Boy or girl? Boy. Okay. I have two boys. Can um, you tell from my gray hair? <laughs> I die. <laughs> um, I okay. Where did, you, where, where did you go to school? In Cole Harbor. Okay. Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. Okay. I was in Sackville. Um, I went to Dow. I went to Dow. Okay. Um, sports. Did you play any sports? Not successfully. <laughs> okay. uh, travel. 
Yes, I've traveled. Um, what's your favorite travel spot? Oh, um, kind of far-fetched, but Nepal. Okay. I've never been in Nepal. Uh, hobbies? Music, piano, singing. Okay. I love music. You play, So you play piano? I do. I don't play piano, but I like to karaoke. And I used to play instruments when I was younger. Like I played ukulele and saxophone. I played the flute. Um, my family's oh. very, very musical. So I, I like music. So when we're even by doing, like talking about some of these things, yeah. we're working in that environment. If we find some commonalities that we have, it might even be some activities that we want to do. So if you like music, I like music. We might even try to plan something at our lunch hour with music and get the team involved, right? right. We might get the team involved. Um, you know, we might end up talking about the kids a bit more. You know, my kids might be older. Maybe your kids are playing sports and my kids might coach sports or things like that, right? So mm -hmm. rather, when we're having a conversation and we're kind of getting to know each other, it looks like we're just asking questions, but we're actually building a rapport based on commonalities, right? Because mm -hmm. oftentimes what happens is when you see someone that's similar to you, you're naturally drawn to that individual, right? It, it mm -hmm. happens a lot. It happens a lot of times. So, if, you know, mm -hmm. you're drawn to that individual because it, you feel safe because it's common. And that's how we sometimes can isolate individuals. But when we actually take the time to, to look for those commonalities that we don't see, then we can actually start to develop a, a rapport with individuals. And some of those rapports might even develop into friendships, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so it is really, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, go, um, go ahead, Rebecca, I apologize. Yeah, so sometimes when you, if you do this activity, it, it's kind of neat when you do it with other individuals. I did it with a group of EDs one time. And the person that I had, uh, that we, when we were trying to dig, I think we had to try to find 10 things in common, but it couldn't be obvious. Um, one of the things we found in common is that we both were inside of a motorcycle shop in between like Port, like down by Portland, Maine and Augusta. I don't know how we ended up talking about that, but I was in that shop one time when I was down that way. And this person like that drives motorcycles, she was in there as well, right? So it was kind of oh, interesting. Wow. And then we had conversations about motorcycles and things like that. So. Yeah. You know, when you see people, sometimes we just say, hi, good morning. How's it going? Like, but sometimes that's a little superficial. Um, right. So really, if someone said, oh, well, it's not good. I come to work. I don't really feel included here. But they wouldn't necessarily say that. There. They might talk about it with their family or talk about it. They might not necessarily bring it because they don't necessarily want to have, um, they don't want to be complaint. They don't want to complain, right? Especially right. if they're, if they're, if they're new to the, to the role. Right. If people are trying to diversify their workforce and they're, they're there, and they're not necessarily feeling welcome. If they say too much, they might, you know, they don't want to be a troublemaker or anything like that. And not that they right. would be, but um, I think it's it is important to build rapport. And there's all kinds of different like that's just one example of like asking questions, um, asking yeah. questions. There could be other activities that you could do, like the team building activities to really get to know people. Right. And create Absolutely. those um, strong uh, working conditions. There are some great, um, great comments in here. I'll start with a comment from Elaine, Rebecca, that, that talks about the missing piece of EDI is okay. social class. Yeah. So she's asking about, about classism and, and colonial institutions. Um, and, uh, and I'll just um, then build on that from uh, Shazi, I believe, who had just said that speaking of social class or even cultural background, some at work school um, may not have, or some people that you're interacting with may not have commonalities around travel, sports, music, university, um, mm -hmm. and, and just addressing that. Um, yep. and, and there's, a, there's, I'll just add to that, um, a second question or something that we can dig into a little bit is how can we improve inclusion in a virtual work environment? Good questions. Okay, so uh, let, we'll talk about classism first. Um, classism is, you know, classism intersects intersects with all kinds of other social locations, right? So when you think about your own social location, um, like if I think of my where like my social location, so I'm, you know, a female, black female. Um, I have, you know, I have kids. I I have I'm, I am educated. But I also grew my mother was a single parent, you know, once my parents divorced, so I would have had some challenges there, right? Um, so the way that I see the world is based on my own social location, right? So everyone has a social location and classism can intersect everything. So, you know, right now I wouldn't say that I'm impacted by classism because I'm not, right? My life could have been very different. I might not have had certain privileges in terms of being educated and being able to travel. I still would have commonalities with individuals that didn't have those experiences. 
those were some of the experiences that I asked because I, you know, I knew we probably we might be able to find some fairly quick. Um, I, I find I, I have commonalities with all kinds of people that maybe even though we're very, very different, we can still find something. It's usually very hard to not find something when you take the time to, to get to know people. It may not be those things that are privileged in terms of um, travel and things like that. But when you think of people, like when you think of classism, classism impacts people of race and culture and ability. Um, and also because of that, sometimes it also, when you think about the different genders, the different genders and um, as things intersect with, even with poverty, like classism doesn't discriminate against anyone. There's not one, one group of people who experience classism. Everybody does. Like every, like, I shouldn't say everybody, but people from all different backgrounds experience classism. And sometimes when you have an idea of people's actual locations or the different intersections, things impact people differently, right? So if we think about even feminism, right? Or if we think about things that maybe um, that impact women, um, there's also things that specifically impact racialized women as well. Like there's that, you know, the gender racism as well. Um, when you think about, and then add in a disability or a mental health challenge or anything else like that, then it's kind of compounding as well, right? And that's another reason when you think about, when we think about diversity, um, it is, it's really, really important to kind of get to know the individual because then they can at least um, let you know how, who they are and how they want to, um, how they either want to interact or how they identify, right? Um, because sometimes when you think, okay, if you think about trying to put people in boxes, in a lot of cases, people don't, don't fit in boxes, right? Especially when they have different, different things that intersect. Um, I'm not sure if that kind of talks a little bit about the classism or not, but classism, but also in terms of classism, there are larger group representation of, um, you know, different races and culture that are overrepresented in, in you know, in terms of being poverty because of access to education or because of discrimination as well and racism. If you think about some of the communities, like here in Nova Scotia, we have, you know, pockets of individuals and these, some of these communities have been there historically and they were placed there hoping that people wouldn't necessarily survive and, you know, hundreds of years later, they still have. Um, there may not be those resources in those communities. They may not have access to those. Or if they do go to school, maybe they don't have themselves represented in terms of the faculty or in terms of the instructors or even in daycares and things like that. There's all kinds of things that can impact class, impact class in economics, right? Yeah, and I, and I think, um, and if, if we can kind of touch a little bit on just inclusion in, in a virtual work environment, you know, understanding that if you are employed by an organization, that that organization is providing you with access to a computer and what you need to work effectively um, and, and hoping that that is a reasonable assumption that you would make. But how do you how do you improve inclusion in that virtual work environment? And there's a comment here of, of you know, people who are introverted, who are more shy, perhaps it has to do with their background or their upbringing or having experiences where classism and um, injustices have impacted them so much so that they're, they're, they, they pull away. Um, and the virtual work environment can allow them to more easily do that, right? Yeah. So how, how do you kind of um, identify those barriers? And, and um, there are some great suggestions here of, of how to I think make people feel um, included and give them opportunities to find commonality, like asking questions of your favorite ice cream flavor or your favorite vacation spot, or you know your those kinds of things that um, can make f help people find commonalities that perhaps aren't um, kind of speaking to classism, like university or sports or that those sorts of things that not all people would have access to. Yeah, and it could be, yeah, it could be, it could be food or, or whatever, but other, th other things, so people generally, I mean, everybody eats, right? You sometimes get from some really picky eaters out there, I'll eat just about anything, so I love, you know what I mean, I'll eat just about anything, and I'll try just about anything, so, you know what I mean, but even eating, eating food, though, isn't really learning about a culture, right? Like, it's, it, it's, it's, it's trying, a, like, if I go up for Thai food, I'm not going to say, ooh, I just had a cultural experience, right, or whatever, you know what I mean, like, we sometimes we have to do a little bit more, the virtual world is very is very interesting. When you think about when a lot of people, especially with COVID, went from home to work, there was all kinds of other things that happened during that time, right? So people would have felt isolated um, and disconnected either from their team and maybe from just even from their family 
So there was an, a lot of people, if you think about, you know, mental health, how, you know, one in five people experience mental health, it's, some, it's, it's higher than that. And I think during COVID, it happened to a lot more, a more, lot more individuals. I think what would need to happen if you're a manager, if you're in one of those roles where you can actually reach out to individuals, I think it's really important for people to have um, individual check-ins, right? Individual check-ins if they're having that, that isolation, either, you know, because of, maybe they're an introvert, they may not say anything. And sometimes if you think about having a meeting, you know, some I, I had an experience where I was watching a meeting and, you know, how you see the participants sometimes and I'm looking at the one person, they just didn't, I don't know, they didn't look like themselves. So I did call them afterwards just to do a check-in. Like, I'm not calling for anything, like work is great, blah, blah, blah. How are you doing? Because you just look like, you know, how are you doing? So I think when you, when, if you're trying to include people and you take the time to, um, when you ask how they're doing really really mean like really mean the question because sometimes you say oh how's it going and you keep going if someone starts saying they were having a bad day we were anticipating that we always anticipate that people are going to say oh yeah it's good da, da, da. like you know they keep it short but i think having those having those one-on-one -on -one conversations or even having conversations with individuals just to kind of find out what they need maybe in order to feel welcome because we know what we need in order to feel safe i think mm -hmm. we should ask that with our co-workers and our teams too what would make what makes you feel what would make you feel included? What do you need to feel safe? What do you need to be able to do? Or what kind of environment do you need to bring your whole, whole self to work? There could be individuals that are in um, same-sex relationships and they want to put posters up, pictures up in their office of their family, but maybe they don't feel comfortable enough because of the environment, right? So it might be a matter of having a conversation. What do you need? And everybody should be able to say what it is that they need to feel to feel safe. This this mm -hmm. is what this is what I need. This is my values. Even when you think about companies, when you um, look at the company that you work for and what are our values, you know, as individuals, they could even do a, a value piece too to see how many things align. And, and chances are pretty high that a number of people, their own personal values will match with the company. So that means it will probably match with the person, you know, the next cubicle over or the next door over, or even when you're thinking on, on the Zoom meetings, those values still apply. And when you have some of those similar values, it's easier to connect. Yeah, and there's a, re there's a really good... Um, kind of comment here about um, how to introduce topics of, and I'm mindful of our time. I know we only have a few minutes left, um, but um, there's just a point here about how to introduce the topics of diversity and inclusion to a team that may view itself as relatively homogenous. Um, and then just a few comments here that I, I, I want to flag, but um, just one person here is saying, asking for recommendations is a powerful way to connect with an individual. It lets the other individual direct the conversation. So making yeah. them feel that their, their voice matters in the conversation. Um, yeah. And then a, a point here that um, there's some really great conversation here in the chat, I have to say. Inclusion online can also be created by intentionally creating open space for a moment to allow for those who don't initiate to be able to participate if they want to. Online discussions have created a bit of competition for airtime which is, is fair. And there's sometimes lags in, uh, in our internet as well. Um, there was um, that one comment, I, want, I did want to touch base on something with the one yeah. comment, with, uh, how do you introduce diversity when you have, you know? Yes. Which is, which is I think, um, a challenge for, for a number of companies. So if you think of Nova Scotia, rural Nova Scotia, there might be communities that have always kind of, maybe they, they look the same, they speak the same, same religion. Uh, maybe not a whole lot of diversity. And then all of a sudden we get, you know, we have a, a, a influx of um, immigration or maybe refugees. And then now communities are like, they're diverse, uh, but they're not necessarily welcome because now there's difference in those communities. I think when you're introducing the topic, it has to initially come in from a position of um, like educational, not a position of um, being punitive. I really like doing a lot of work around biases. I think biases, when people can actually understand their biases and make different connections, I think that's really important when they can identify that so they understand why it is that they're feeling a certain way. Um, oftentimes, if people, you know, I guess if they, it's a lot, and also a lot of times too, some of the information people have, are, it's just not incorrect. People are not informed. There, there, a lot of the comments that you hear sometimes that are, you know, racist or that are discriminatory, it's a lot of it's based on ignorance. Um, but I don't think diversity is one of those things to talk about that you try to hammer in and we must do this. I think it has to be a conversation. I think that it's, if, if you have a homogenous team and you're thinking about doing, uh, like if you're going to diversify the workforce, I think there needs to be some work done with that team ahead of time before bringing that person in that might have an experience of you know, discrimination or harassment. 
Um, but I do think, you know, biases is a good place to start and then go from there. We're never, ever going to be, you're never going to ever be culturally confident or confident in anyone else's culture. Like you can be, you know, you might be an expert in your own experience, but, you know, even for me, there's other black women that, you know, that have kids, our experiences are still different. Like I wouldn't speak for everybody, but I think um, if they start doing their own self-reflection and they're not feeling like, you know, especially if they can communicate in a way that they're, they're not being judged while they're learning, it keeps the mind much more, it keeps the mind way more open to learning and they can learn at their own pace. Mm. No, that's great. This was fantastic conversation. I hate, I hate to, to end it, but I just want to be respectful of people's time and, uh, and, and the 30 minute mark that we've reached. And there's just a perfectly timed question from, from someone here. Will the recording be made available to attendees? And, and yes, it will. Um, we will be sending for all of the people who attended today and all of the people who registered, we'll be sending along later in the day an email with a recording of the webinar and also with a link to the course that Rebecca will be teaching at the beginning of January called Workplace Diversity and Inclusion, which will really dig into some of the topics that we really just scratched the surface on today. Um, so I, I'm just so delighted, um, Rebecca, that you took the time to, to host today and that was really focused on conversation um, because that's, I, I think, a, a big part of, of um, understanding um, diversity and inclusion and, and how we can um, how we can introduce it in our, in our own lives and, and yeah, be better stewards of, of those practices. So, yeah, I know. I feel like we didn't have enough time of like to get going, but, you know. Another time. <laughs> Another time, absolutely. And we would we would welcome you back um, for for our part two. I agree, part two. That's what Tracy said here in the chat. So um, that's great. And uh, and so we will send around that email. I would encourage you to fill out a survey that you'll receive at the end of the webinar. Um, and thanks so much again, Rebecca. And um, we'll see about perhaps if people have further questions, if, if you wish to include your email um, and they might be able to reach out to you directly. So um, thank you so much again, everyone. Thank you again, Rebecca. And uh, have a wonderful rest of your day. Enjoy the rest of the day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.